So anyway, that's, that's, that's what we do. That's how all of this fits together. And uh, I think we should take our, no, no, I was gonna say, we should take our first break. Okay, so anyway, let's, let's move on now. Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, 26A2. So what if the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure are, is the rule book that all lawyers use when they're in federal court, and it describes how they try a case, and what they have to do, the way they, it's a procedural guideline. It's not substantive, it's all procedure. And there are certain rules in this that apply to experts. In case you don't know, I don't know, we all have different backgrounds, there's basically a, a, a dual level of courts in this country. There are the state courts, and all 50 states have their own state courts, and then there are federal courts, and they run parallel with each other. There's, there's, there's lower level state courts, there's lower level federal courts, there's higher level state courts, there's higher level, and they really run parallel. There's differences, but way beyond the scope of our discussion, but, but there are really two sets. What we're talking about here are federal rules. Each of the states have very, very similar rules, rule, bodies of rules, and in each instance where I talk about a federal rule, each of the 50 states have their own rules that are pretty similar to, in terms of the- 49 states. states. Louisiana is- Well, they do it in French. Extremely different, but other yeah. than that, yeah. Yeah, because Louisiana is based on the French system, yeah. the Napoleonic Code. Napoleon. Anybody know Napoleon? Oh, no. Okay. So anyway, Rule 26A2, disclosure of expert testimony. So here's the deal. You're going to be hired as an expert, and this is nice income. This is a good thing. Everybody should consider being hired to do expert work. It's fun. It's interesting. And uh, it, you should think about looking for these possibilities. You know, it's, it's, it's a nice it's supplemental source of income. And, um, and it sort of gives you a chance to do something that you're not doing all the time. You're, if you are hired to be an expert, you're gonna, you're gonna prepare what's called an expert report for the attorney that's retained you, retained your services. And, um, uh, and, and, and the, the rules of civil procedure define how a report, uh, how the report works, what has to be disclosed in it. Um, you have to, each side has to disclose in advance who the expert's going to be and what they're going to talk about. And uh, Rule 26A, 2A requires the disclosure of the identity of any person who may be used at trial to present evidence. So that's, that's the federal rule that, that applies. Rule 26A, 2 says this, it deals with the disclosure of expert testimony, and it says essentially that. Um, the time for disclosing the experts may be set by, by court, and, and, and the case of Southern Union says that you really can't ambush somebody. You have to give somebody at least, you know, advanced notice of what the other side's gonna say. So the idea is this, you're hired as an expert in a case, the lawyer that you work for is gonna prepare with you an expert report that's going to explain your opinions, and that expert report's gonna be given to the other side with ample time before trial so that they can digest it and respond to it as they deem to be appropriate. That's the way it always works, with the exception in New York, by the way. I think in the, the difference in New York is sometimes they don't exchange expert reports. But for the most part, that's how, that's how this deal works. And, and that's what you would do. That would be your first task, your first legal task, your first official task if you're in a trial is you would prepare this expert report. Um, Rule 26 uh, also deals with, uh, requires that the expert reports be in writing. And here's one, are you ready for the, uh, let's talk about the Nyberger case. Anybody know it? Okay, anyway, there's this case called the Nyberger case, which says that, but this is always one of these interesting issues. Uh, it's interesting. I hire somebody to be an expert for me as an appraiser in a case. And I ask him to do an expert report, I say, Sir, I, I'm hiring you to be an expert. I need you to do an expert report in this particular project. Give me a report by Tuesday. You're gonna look at me and say, what in the world do you expect from me? I've never written a report for a lawyer in my life. I don't know what you want. Uh, maybe I've done tax appeal reports, but I don't know if what you want is the same thing. Well, how do I know how to do that? Here's the, little, the dirty little secret so that I'm gonna share with you so that you never have to lose even a moment to sleep ever again. The lawyers can help you write the report. So that's your Nyberger decision. It says the lawyers can help you write the report. And as a matter of fact, they can do more than help you write the report. They could basically write the report as long as the report completely 
covers your opinion. You don't have to really write the report. This isn't a writing test. Be, being hired as an, as an expert in litigation isn't supposed to be a test of your writing abilities. You're being hired because you have certain level of expertise and you're being asked to assist the court in an area that the court doesn't have basic lay, doesn't have any knowledge about. And they're looking to you because you do. So the lawyer can help you write the report, but it has to 100% cover your opinion. It can't be the lawyer's opinion. So that's how it works, too. Whether there was a Nyberg opinion or not, that's the way it works. And when we're dealing in my office with an expert who hasn't done a lot of work, we help the expert a lot because otherwise that, that process will go on for years, you know? For the poor person first tries to do it, you make some suggestions, you set it back, and it could go on for a long time, and the expert gets pretty frustrated, and there's no reason to do that. So the lawyer, the lawyer could work with you and, uh, and help you. What was going on out there? Are we okay? <laughs> is, this the, is this the next alarm? I know we had one in the morning. <laughs> Question in the oh, back. Oh, yes, sir. Correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. but appraisers can work on hearsay information and it's acceptable in all courts. Now, uh, we always hear that we have to have all our backup information, but you, if you interview someone who you perceive as an expert and you bring that to court, it's acceptable, but it's called hearsay information. Okay, so I, I want to make sure I understand the question. Are you asking me, is it acceptable for an appraiser to rely in forming his or her opinion on what would otherwise be inadmissible because it's hearsay. Is that Possibly, your question? Possibly, yes. You know. is, does that, but, is, you, but not, what triggered my thought there was you saying, get me the report this afternoon, you know? Yeah. And I said, well, there's a lot of things that go on that you know, but it's hearsay, and that's what formulates, oh, you I know, see what it you're brings saying. together your expert no. opinion. Well, we're going to... We, you know, we have a long time together today, so we're going to get there. But I want to tell you, let, 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 let me answer your question, though, in, in a way, because, you know, we want every customer to be satisfied. Here's the answer. Under the federal rules and in every single court, an expert can rely on information that would otherwise not be admissible in forming his or her opinion. Whether the expert can share that information with the court depends on certain circumstances. But an expert is always allowed to rely on information that independent of the report wouldn't be admissible. Um, and for example, hearsay. Yes? Collaborate on that. I don't yeah. think it's hard because uh, I've been told that don't say you confirmed it with such and such a broker. Say it, it was in your research that you came across. Because they say if you say yeah. such and such a broker, that's you're saying they can't cross-examine that broker. So you have to just say, in my research. So I guess that's... The yeah, I mean, that's a little tricky. I, I don't think I'd be even... I, I think if, if, if I had an appraiser who was giving me a report and part of his or her factual predicate for the report was information provided to him by another professional, I wouldn't hesitate. I would allow him to say that. And that would, not, that would be hearsay. And uh, that's a very, very good example. Independent of the fact that that's being used as part of an expert report, you would not be able to admit it because that would be hearsay. Hearsay is when you say to somebody, uh, ma'am, how did you know that? And you say, because he said it to me. Normally, you can't say what somebody said to you because that's called hearsay, right? So that's what he, I mean, everybody heard of this hearsay thing, right? Everybody's a hearsay, but you don't know what it is. Hearsay is when somebody, when you're being asked to testify about what somebody said to you. That you can't normally say. But as an expert, you can say it. An expert can use and rely on hearsay. Now, whether, whether you can provide a lot of independent testimony about that hearsay and, and expound upon it is another issue. Sometimes you can and sometimes you can't, and there's a little weighing, a little balancing that goes on, and the court will determine whether you can. But experts can always rely on hearsay, and they can always rely on things that might otherwise not be admissible informing the report, not just appraisal experts, but all experts all of the time, 365 days a year. Except for you shouldn't be working on Christmas. Yes.